right. So for today's seminar, we're very happy to have Peter Horava from uh, Berkeley talking about large N expansion and string theory out of equilibrium. Please, Peter, take it away. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for having me. And it's great to visit Stanford, even if only virtually this time. And uh, I'm happy to see lots of uh, familiar names from Stanford and outside of Stanford. So thank you for showing up for this uh, seminar. I'll be talking about the large N expansion and string theory out of equilibrium. I, actually, let me switch glasses here for something which I can actually use to read on the screen. Um, large N expansion and string theory, both topics will be taken out of equilibrium and their relationship it will be examined in that out of equilibrium scenario for several reasons. First of all, this is work done with uh, Chris Mani, my student. Chris will be graduating this year. Um, although I'm, I have to say I'm worried about the young people because I feel like there are very few jobs that seem to be opening and uh, must be a difficult position to be in. Uh, so Chris and I have uh, written three papers on this topic. We've worked on it for, for a while from actually before the pandemic hit. But finally, we've uh, reached a point where we can summarize some of the exciting results. And we actually wrote three papers in the past two months. These are the three papers. The first one treats the basic story. The third one expands it to the so-called Keldish rotated version of the theory. And the middle one is a short summary that uh, highlights some of the results of both long papers. So hopefully everyone can find their own way how to get into this topic by reading either the long papers or the short one. So this is a very exciting topic for us uh, and uh, only the tip of the iceberg, I believe. By the way, Chris should be checking in for this particular meeting as well. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to relegate all, all the difficult questions to him. And uh, let me begin by focusing on the big picture, kind of highlighting why we are interested in this particular approach. And the point is that string theory, of course, is an exciting framework that is useful not only for high energy physics and a unification of forces and quantum gravity, but has reached far beyond that in uh, providing new techniques and uh, generating spin-off ideas that have been revolutionary in many different areas of physics as well, in, in particular condensed matter physics, some influence in cosmology, but hopefully much more to come, as well as other areas. And uh, it makes me wonder whether uh, this is the full story. Are we close to having a complete understanding of string theory, or are we seeing only a small corner of string theory so far? The reason why I personally believe that we might be only seeing so far a small corner of string theory has a historical origin. As we all know, the origin of string theory came from high energy theory and in particular from the S matrix program in the 1960s, when people were very curious about strong interactions and in particular about properties of scattering of particles. And the S matrix formalism was uh, proposed as a framework where some of the difficulties of local quantum field theory can be avoided. The S matrix program was very deeply rooted in the idea that the system has obviously a Minkowski invariant a uh, stable static eternal vacuum. And on top of the vacuum, the interesting observables are the in-out scattering amplitudes. That might not apply to other areas of physics. And uh, in particular, if for some reason you're interested in very far from equilibrium physics, including for example, for cosmology where you might have a big bang or a big crunch or some other reason why you cannot rely on the eternal static vacuum. The question is, is string theory going to be very useful and powerful for cosmology or other non-equilibrium systems, including mesoscopic physics, condensed matter out of equilibrium? Are there some limitations that would prevent us from applying string theory in that context? And I believe so far we have formulated especially perturbative string theory expansions with that uh, historical burden of the S matrix uh, heritage. And we have not been able to free up fully the picture of string theory 
to disconnect it from that assumption, the implicit but strong assumption of the st stable static eternal vacuum. So is it possible to somehow relax? That would be my personal hope, the personal motivation for starting this program. Can we relax the reliance on the S matrix postulates in string theory and somehow free it up of the eternal vacuum assumption to push it further towards non-equilibrium and hopefully allow us to revolutionize cosmology similarly as uh, string theory revolutionized, for example, particle phenomenology. So far, we have seen many partial results in string cosmology, but I feel like there is a reason why string theory does not seem to be equally good at describing systems far away from supersymmetry. Systems which are not stable or static or not supersymmetric and protected therefore uh, for the stability of the vacuum. Those are interesting physics questions and string theory so far has not been as powerful in giving us insights into those particular types of systems. So if, if there is a way of relaxing these fundamental principles of string theory to push string theory away from equilibrium, how would we approach this? In so, so Petter, can I, yes, can I um, discuss a little bit your first page, uh, unless it's yes. just tangential? It's um, tangential, I'm sure, but go ahead. Okay, okay, then it's okay. Uh, no, no, please. Um, yeah, I would just actually take the opposite view. I don't think it's string theory is much of an impact on phenomenology at you know collider scales, but it has more of an impact in early universe cosmology just because the energy scales and field range scales and so on are that much larger, and that's what gives us more of a handle on um, even empirical tests of string yeah, theoretic effects. I'm, I'm, um, and I'm, I, I'm I but I completely agree with your big picture here that there's a huge amount more to do. Exactly. Yeah, that's, there's that's brief point. comment. Yeah, you can yeah I, I understand. And I, a tre tremendous amount has been accomplished already in string inspired cosmology, as you of all people know very well. There have been big, important books written on the topic. And I still feel there can be much more if we somehow find out how to formulate from first principles the theory without that eternal static vacuum assumption. That would make things much easier, presumably. And on the phenomenology side, I think we should remember how many of the ideas that are being claimed by particle phenomenologists have originated from string theory, including large extra dimensions, the Randall Sundrum scenario, other ideas that came out of string theory constructions that wouldn't have been possible in phenomenology. So I think even the phenomenologists would agree that uh, phenomenology has benefited uh, quite a bit, at least in providing DSM scenarios that would have otherwise been unavailable if we didn't have string theory around. So yeah, in both in both subjects. So so, so we, we could talk more Sorry, about yeah, it. I, I, yeah, I, I, of course. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with all, all that. That's even an interesting measurement in neuroscience that somehow ideas are easier to come by via string theory right. <laughs> in, in both subjects. But the other th the other thing I just wanted to mention is that um, there are specific examples where we where it's you know quite time dependent and quite out of at least far from supersymmetry where there's good string theoretic control things like um, the time like linear dilaton and even sure. um, yes. desider constructions which are perturbative and in that case one element that you need is something like Fisher Susskind where you play off the different right. orders as as part of stabilizing or, the dilaton um, or, so there's there's but these are kind of bits and pieces so I exactly yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that was exactly if you look at our first paper that's what we are saying in the introduction that there have been amazing partial results. For example, tachyon condensation, that's another example where a lot of uh, good control has been achieved for time dependent uh, non-equilibrium processes, but it's all kind of patchy and it would be nice to have some more systematic starting point. So I'll now go back all the way to the beginning of string theory essentially and ask whether we can reformulate perturbative strings to begin with, uh, to retrace the historical origins of string theory away from equilibrium. And the point is that uh, if you look at non-string theory quantum mechanics, any other quantum systems that people have studied, in fact, there is a formalism available, as many of you know very well. There is a fully non-equilibrium form formulation of quantum mechanics available, which goes beyond what we typically teach in relativistic quantum field theory, and it's known as the Schwinger-Keldysh formalism. 
So let me motivate the origin of this formalism and highlight some of its features. It essentially leads to a, an effective doubling of the number of fields that you need in comparison to, to the conventional S matrix type formulation of relativistic field theory. And it comes about by considering Heisenberg, sorry for the misspelling of Heisenberg, um, Heisenberg picture correlators of some fields in some many body system could be relativistic, could be non-relativistic. And let's concentrate concentrate on the time ordered product of these observables for simplicity. And instead of evaluating this in the vacuum expectation value of the true vacuum of the system, let me put it in some arbitrary state. And let's also illustrate the formalism. The formalism can be illustrated in many different ways, but let's illustrate it by asking the specific question in the interaction picture and assuming that the initial state has been prepared, this, this uh, assumption can be relaxed uh, by an, an adiabatic turning on of interactions from some initial state vacuum zero in. And when you perform the usual analysis of the interaction picture, you roughly speaking end up with this particular expression where the interaction picture evolution operator that takes you from some time t to t prime, I call it S here, often it's called with capital U, is also a time ordered exponential of the interaction picture interaction part of the Hamiltonian. These technicalities are well known, but the highlight and the important feature of the full formalism without simplifying by making a, an assumption about the static nature of the vacuum. If I don't make an assumption about the static nature of the vacuum, Notice this very important S inverse prefactor here. By the usual properties of the time evolution operator, if you have an inverse S matrix uh, operator like this, it evolves you from the infinite future back to the infinite past of the system. So as a result, unless you can somehow absorb this inverse S into just a phase as it acts on the inside in, in, in uh, incoming vacuum, you have to deal with it and it's standing outside of the time ordered uh, symbol here. Therefore, as a result, the st standard Feynman propagators will not be sufficient to decode perturbation theory. Cross terms between this S inverse and the operators inside the time ordered symbol will appear and they'll take the form of four different uh, causal versions of propagators. So you'll get uh, retarded advanced propagators or linear combinations thereof. There will be four different types of propagators depending on how you avoid the holes in the frequency space. So this is important because we have many more propagators now in perturbation theory. And uh, we can summarize it by saying that the system is being evolved from the infinite past or some initial time T, maybe it's uh, regulated to be finite to some time in the future. Again, maybe it's infinite future, maybe it's some regulating time Maybe in cosmology, that time in the future might be actually the present where we insert correlation functions of observables that we are interested in, for example, for CMB and isotropies and such. And then the system is evolved back in time. So this famous schwinger kelly time contour, let me draw it here. So time for me goes up and the system is being evolved along a C plus branch of the time contour and then brought back along the opposite direction. There is a small regulating epsilon here to make the drawing more visually understandable. And the time t wedge, again, as I said, might be either the infinite future, where we declare that we don't have an a priori knowledge about the vacuum of the system, the final state of the system. It might not be the initial vacuum. Therefore, we evolve back and calculate correlation functions in the in-in uh, way. So when we put word lines, on such. So first of all, before I talk about word lines, let's just see what kind of two point functions will be relevant now on this schwinger keldish time contour. So first of all, instead of talking about fields, let's consider some field phi as a function on this complicated two branched time contour. I can think of this field phi as living on the conventional time axis between T0 and T wedge at the cost of doubling the fields. So the field values on the plus branch of the contour will be called phi plus. The fields on the backward branch will be called phi minus, and they're now both functions only of just the forward time uh, direction. Can, so when can, I I ask, this, can I ask a very yes. naive question that's always bothered me, but I just wanted to know about it. Um, 
if in principle you didn't have like you didn't want to go all the way out to time infinity for the s matrix but you had the full interacting hamiltonian the non perturbative formulation could this right. formulation be could you could this be done in finite volume can you do this to instead of saying let me do to an infinite time slice and infinite region of space and still proceed with this formalism. Yes, there, there, is, there is so many different variations on this same theme. So I'm only taking one particular path through the story. Uh, indeed, in the mesoscopic physics, people have studied uh, the Schrodinger-Kaldish uh, formalism in finite volume for physics reasons. And uh, you can play with these many ingredients and, and play different games, insert observables in different parts, including, for example, at this uh, turnaround point uh, in time. So depending on the physical application, it can mean different things, but let's coarse grain over that for now and let's try to be as universal as possible. So I'll, I'll, I'll all keep right, thank the you. wedge finite for now, but it's after all the insertions of possible correlation functions that we are interested in. So, so now if I um, decode the two point functions, for example, I could calculate the two point functions between five plus and five plus, and if I imagine some Schwinger like parametrization of this propagator from phi plus to phi plus at T1 and T2, there will be a word line contributing that goes roughly topologically like this. Or you can calculate, and of course, this would give you the standard Feynman propagator, the causal propagator of quantum field theory in the relativistic setting. Or you can calculate a correlation function between phi plus and phi minus, in which case this would give you a, the unordered. Um, the time unordered uh, two point function between five, two copies of phi and a typical word line that would dominate the path integral representation of the propagator would have to go around this uh, turnaround point at t wedge in the future in time. So this is just to illustrate that uh, even if you forget non-equilibrium, go back to standard zero temperature equilibrium relativistic field theory, you have already seen this schwinger keldish formalism in that corner of quantum field theory, it takes the form of Katkowski rules and the rules for unit proving unitarity of the S matrix. Remember in that proof of unitarity, we draw Feynman diagrams with cuts. There is a shaded region of the Feynman diagram. There's a sunny region of the Feynman diagram and the, the cut between the two regions corresponds precisely to this turnaround point. So the shaded region is in fact the minus branch of the schwinger keldish contour where you take the zero temperature equilibrium limit and the sunny part of the diagram is on this plus branch of the, of the contour. So it's interesting to ask, for example, if we now put string theory on this type of schwinger keldish time contour, can we, for example, repeat the proof of unitarity using Katkowski rules perturbatively? And if not, what are the obstacles? What are the ingredients that we would need? Would, for example, string worksheets also undergo these interesting cuts. Would you, for example, when you calculate a propagation of a string uh, between the plus and the minus branch, would you expect that there is some cut between two portions of the string worksheets, maybe a forward portion of the string worksheet connected along some bunch of boundaries to the backward branch of the string worksheet? So that would be one of the first questions that we would want to ask in string perturbation theory by generalizing the picture of particle theory to string theory. But this is difficult because we are missing many ingredients, presumably, in how to construct this in detail. So let's see. Petter, Petter, sorry, can I ask you a question? Sure. How, how far oh. does the light cone formalism go for this? Um, as you know, I really uh, am a big fan of treating time differently and uh, treating relativistic symmetry only as an afterthought. So I don't particularly uh, dwell on the light cone formalism. It could be possible to formulate, for example, this in light cone gauge. This could be a useful way of uh, connecting to the fact that you can prove perturbative unitarity much more easily there, even in the first quantized theory. But that was the direction that we did not want to take, so I have not really explored that. We were we are really treating time a priori as 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 a on a different footing from space and looking at Lorentz invariance only as an afterthought that we might want to prove in some specific backgrounds. But hopefully, there will be many more situations where time and space. Uh, behave differently for good physics reasons. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Not so, not so much. No, I said question? yes. Thanks. Okay. okay. May I ask a question? Sure. So this phi of t, it's uh, not a boundary operator anymore. It's a like bot operator. In particular, it doesn't uh, correspond to a particle on shell. 
Yeah, this this would be if you if you are thinking the anal analogy with let's say ADS CFT, then this is on the CFT side, or in fact in some non-trivial state which breaks the conformal symmetry. So then you can talk about the analogy of this matrix, and uh, most of our my arguments will not involve any form of holography whatsoever, even though. My main tool, which I would like to use, is indeed large N expansion that did lead to holography uh, in the sense of uh, ads cfd correspondence. So I, I want to go back quickly. This probably is not necessary to explain in any detail to this audience. We know very well that in equilibrium, when you look at things like QCD or supersymmetry yang males, any theory of quantum degrees of freedom, which are matrices, you can expand in the large N and get a formal expansion where the coefficients are associated with some hypothetical string theory dual, order by order in the power of one over n. H is the number of handles associated with the topology. The more complex the topology of the surface, the higher the order in perturbation theory. So this, is, this observation was made by various people and stressed over the years, decades before ADS-CFT was discovered, going back to Tuft. Uh, even Poyakov and others who have stressed how insightful this prediction is that somehow matrix theories, whether or not they are relativistic field theories or just quantum mechanics of matrices, they should all have some more or less mysterious string theory duals. So if we can only somehow constrain the right hand side by having additional control, we might be predicting a powerful duality between large N matrix systems and string theory. This is indeed what played out in the equilibrium systems starting from finally ADS-CFT in 1997. But the question is, can we extend this same prediction to non-equilibrium? So my point of view is that you can look at this ex expression here as a huge missed opportunity. As a community, we could have perhaps taken a closer look at this for some specific examples of course, hindsight is 2020, but if you constrained this, for example, by superconformal symmetry, it would have been possible in retrospect to predict the dualities much before they were discovered from string theory in, in the 90s. So do we have a similar missed opportunity in front of us now when we don't look seriously at the analog of this expansion away from equilibrium? The point being that on the field theory side, we know exactly how to formulate the theory away from equilibrium using this magic or schwinger keldish formalism. On the string side, we have a priori no clue how to formulate string perturbation theory from first principles, uh, generalizing it to this hypothetical schwinger keldish formalism. So my hope is if we look at this expansion more carefully away from equilibrium, we might learn some really unexpected and important highlights for how to approach the string side of the duality. And that's indeed the the strategy. So everybody knows, uh, just for maybe the youngest people in the audience, uh, if you need to see an example, take a theory of matrices. I'm only keeping track of time. I'm suppressing all the spatial dependencies. So this could be supersymmetric yang mills in a cartoon version, or it could be just a matrix theory. And I have a quadratic term, and then I have a bunch of single trace interaction terms. They're all controlled for simplicity by one overall coupling. There are propagators, which are ribbons, because the degree of freedom M is a matrix. Vertices are ribbon vertices. And if I fix lambda, the hoofed coupling here, then I can organize a typical diagram built out of these ribbons into a string perturbation expansion associated with the appropriate power of N, which will be, the, uh, which will be set by the genus or the Euler number of a surface associated uniquely with the diagram. So this is all extremely well known. So I'm just repeating it for completeness. And to give you just one example, this is a ribbon diagram that you can draw on a torus. That's the lowest genus surface that can be drawn in. And therefore, for each ribbon diagram, you always associate a canonical surface on which it can be drawn by just filling in all these closed loops by disks. In this particular case, there'll be, I suppose, or five disks glued in, and this will give you a toroidal topology. You can double check by calculating the Euler number using the combinatorial definition. V is the number of vertices of the diagram. E is the number of propagators. L is the number of closed loops. 
And this is the chi that tells you at which order in the string perturbation theory this diagram will contribute. Again, the catch of this very universal relation is that a priori it gives us no insight whatsoever into the dynamics of the worksheet that would somehow reproduce magically these coefficients, but at least gives you a starting point. You can start, start constraining the system by invoking additional requirements, symmetries and such, and eventually you might hope to have enough constraining that you can read off the dual string theory. This is what could have happened. That's how ADS-CFT could have been discovered in the maximally supersymmetric case. Historically, it was not, but uh, in retrospect, this could have been done uh, before Maldasena. So let's take this large N expansion away from equilibrium and see what happens. Are there some universal lessons that we can learn without imposing too many additional conditions? First of all, the schwinger keldish action will now depend on these doubled fields, m plus and m minus, which are the forward and backward branch values of the matrix field M. And it formally takes this difference form. This does not treat M plus and M minus as completely disconnected. They actually talk to each other by whatever boundary conditions you need to impose at the place where the two branches of the time contour meet. But formally, this gives rise to simple Feynman rules. Propagators will now be labeled at both ends by pluses or minuses. And each vertex will again come either from this part of the action or that other part of the action. So it gets a natural label, either plus or minus. So we see that the ribbon diagrams now have a refined structure compared to what we have seen in equilibrium. We have more ingredients. And this suggests that perhaps string perturbation theory that's dual to this set of ribbon diagrams will also carry some additional structure. So our goal was to identify what additional structure the string theory perturbation theory carries universally without depending on some particular details of a particular system of matrix degrees of freedom. So this should be universally a prediction, regardless of whether this is relativistic particle physics or whether we are talking about mesoscopic non-equilibrium non-relativistic systems or cosmology. So how do we start seeing this additional structure? The first starting point might be to recall that when we were drawing these um, schwinger keldish contours, word lines of point-like particles were exhibiting cuts whenever they had to cross from one branch of the time contour to the other. You can mark a point here and say that this is a cut across the propagator. And then on the full Feynman diagram, you connect all these cuts. And in zero temperature equilibrium, you would you would have reproduced the Katkowski rules of unitarity. So how about strings? If we have string worksheets that we built uh, out of these ribbon diagrams by the standard procedure of filling in all disks um, or all boundaries using disks, and wouldn't it be natural to then say, if you have a plus end of a propagator and then a minus end of the propagator, then there has to be, again, a cut across the propagator. And perhaps the worksheets are just made out of these ribbons which occasionally experience a cut. The cuts connect to some overall boundary between sigma plus and sigma minus regions of the worksheet. And uh, this would seem somewhat natural. In fact, it seemed natural to us at first before we looked more carefully into, into this. So let me give you an example where this expectation actually plays out. We have a Feynman diagram, ribbon diagram on the left. There are cuts across all the plus minus propagators of which we have four and they can be uniquely connected into this overall cut. So I would call the plus region, the sigma plus worksheet. It gives the topology of a disk and it is connected across this boundary, which is circular when I look at this as a planar diagram to sigma minus the backward branch of the worksheet, which is also a disk on this side of the ribbon diagram. So this seems natural until you start considering more complicated ribbon diagrams. The simplest, one of the simplest examples of uh, ambiguities that can appear in this procedure is illustrated in this diagram, which is non-planar. It would live on a torus. More importantly, it has a bunch of plus minus propagators. It has one along this edge, one along this edge, and then one across from here to here. So if you look at a particular plaquette, uh, the one that would be glued in on the inside of these lines that I'm indicating here, 
as you travel around the edges of the plaquette, you actually see four times a plus minus propagators. There will be four cuts coming into this plaquette and there is an ambiguity in how you connect them to form an overall dimension one manifold of cuts inside the worksheet. So let me illustrate this on a, an even bigger plaquette which has ed eight edges and it has six plus minus propagators. Each of them has a cut through it and in order to extend these cuts across the entire worksheet, you have to somehow find a way of connecting these individual cuts across propagators to extend them through the plaquette. And clearly there are three out of actually five different options that are drawn here. Clearly there is no uniqueness. Once you have more than two cuts entering a plaquette, there is always an ambiguity how to connect them. So in order to resolve this ambiguity, well, I, you could keep the ambiguity, but if you keep the ambiguity, then you end up summing in perturbation theory over this completely messy set of uh, complicated ambiguous cuts and all these diagrams would contribute multiple times. That doesn't seem natural. So we can resolve the ambiguity by deciding by hand to mark a point in the middle of the plaquette and just simply connect all the cuts to that one marked point. This would be uh, logical from the point of view of taking the Poincaré dual to the ribbon diagram. If you go to the dual, which associates a vertex with each plaquette of the original diagram, a plaquette with each original vertex of the diagram and uh, a propagator that goes across each original propagator, this would be a natural construction in the dual language, but I don't want to get into that uh, mathematical side. Let's just see how we can stare at this resolution of the ambiguities and turn this into something which is more palatable than a complicated graph with vertices. If we kept this picture that was indicated here, we, we would have gained the uniqueness of the completion of the cuts across each plaquette but the resulting object is not a nice boundary between two reg regions. It's a complicated graph with many vertices and it would be very difficult to even classify them, not to mention to sum over them. So instead what we do is we uh, widen uniquely these graph cuts into a surface. And this is indeed a portion of the Poincaré dual ribbon diagram to the original diagram, if you think about it geometrically. In any way, it gives us a widened two-dimensional surface with boundaries. The boundaries are now indicated by red. And these connect to each other naturally and uniquely across all the other plaquettes. And finally, they give us a natural decomposition of the original surface sigma into not two parts connected by a boundary, but three parts. There's gonna be everything that has only plus vertices inside will correspond to the sigma plus part of the worksheet. Everything with sigma mi with minus vertices corresponds to sigma minus, but there is now a new two-dimensional topological surface, which is required in order to connect sigma plus and sigma minus. We will call it sigma wedge, simply because the, the instant in time where uh, the two branches of the time contour meet, it looks like the tip of a wedge in the time goes up notation that we are using. And the important thing is that now the decomposition is that into a triple part uh, decomposition of the surface. So you could say, oh, this is just uh, uh, playing with uh, just drawings. Maybe this seemingly two dimensional surface is just topologically trivial in, in most relevant cases, but it's not so. It is actually as topologically non-trivial on its own as the plus or minus parts of the Riemann surface. In particular, it's easy to see that the sigma wedge region, which was constructed from these very simple looking innocent cuts across individual propagators going all the way here. But when we realize what they imply for the full surface, you end up with a complicated topology. So sigma wedge can, I claim, have arbitrarily high genus. This is an example of a ribbon diagram that uh, would produce the following Riemann surface. Sigma plus would be a disk, sigma minus will be a disk and they'll be connected through this connected higher genus Riemann surface with two boundaries. And it is constructed from a ribbon diagram as follows. You have N triple vertices, all are of the plus kind here. And I've attached only half of, halves of propagators. Similarly here, you have only minus vertices, the same number of them. I just labeled them by primes to distinguish them from 
the ones on the left. If I glue these together, this is something that you can actually play with in real time. If you take three outside legs, I was thinking about making a model of this uh, from just strips of paper. You can take three such strips of paper and connect them to three strips of paper such that you form a sphere, or you can re-glue them in the opposite order. So instead of one, two, one and two, two, two prime or something, you, or you glue them in the opposite order. And uh, as you can see, this will then give a rise, this is simple, simple combinatorics to any arbitrary number, I think it's n half or something of handles inside. I think it's uh, n minus one divided by two handles inside this um, sigma wedge uh, Riemann surface or topological surface. It does not necessarily carry any a priori complex structure. Well, one, uh, one question I just want to be in the definition of a sigma wedge. Can yes. I think of it as like the set of all possible cuts? Is that what I, because like, can you, like the in your original picture you had like two slides ago, you had uh, sets of possible cuts and essentially all of these things, all these cuts are slices that with, are within the surface you drew. So I'm asking if, if you, should you think of it as like the set of all possible cuts? We, we believe that these blue lines are kind of a mirage. They carry much more information that's actually physically there. There will be too many such uh, ingredients to sum over. And I think it's much more natural to think of the cut as actually being represented by the entire surface. So the way to cut. OK, thank this, you. This is the perfect question for the uh, line down here. Measure once, cut twice. This is our prescription that we have phenomenologically extracted from this analysis about what cut even mean, cuts even mean in string theory. A cut will not be a one dimensional boundary between the forward part and the backward part, unlike in word lines. For word sheets, you have to, as long as there is a part sigma plus and a part sigma minus, in order to find what is the cut between them, you have to cut twice. You have to first tell me what is the boundary between sigma plus and sigma wedge, and then cut the second time, tell me what are the boundaries between sigma wedge and sigma minus, and the genus, and topology associated with the cut. That's how you characterize the cut. So that's one of the main surprising but true results of our analysis that the cuts in string worksheets are not just co-dimension one boundaries between segments. They are actually equipped with their own topological expansion. And in particular, the boundaries on the two sides, don't, they don't have to be isomorphic to each other. So it really seems that these Two-dimensional smooth surfaces are the best language that summarizes what the cuts look like. If you try to use any of these reduced constructions from before, maybe you just rely on the blue lines, you either have too many of them, or you, you end up with ugly, complicated graphs of cuts, and nobody knows what that means. In order to get something topologically natural, you have to allow the surface to become two-dimensional, and that's indeed what comes out from the topological analysis. Just by staring at the combinatorics of these ribbon diagrams, this is the natural classification that comes out. Sorry? Uh, hi. Uh, so the, uh, the cut sigma wedge part on the world sheet yes. is still maps to a co-dimension one uh, surface in the target space, right? Well, to the extent that we, first of all, this could very much depend on what kind of string theory realization you're looking for. In critical string theory, we don't even know what that co-dimension would mean because, of course, we have logarithmic divergence, infrared divergence that makes the worksheet fluctuate everywhere in space time. So to talk okay. about the uh, kind of classical limit of uh, what kind of dimension uh, this uh, wedge region probes in space time, I think that would be somewhat premature. We don't really have any, any opinion on that. So, so far we are trying to look for the simplest, most universal predictions and these more dynamical questions, including all the virtue dynamics that populates any of these three regions, that's beyond the current scope of the, of the work. All right, thank you. So one quick tangential note, this, this talk could have been, ta could have been uh, titled alternatively, children's drawings at the end of time. And that's, that sounds kind of funny or maybe apocalyptic, but that's actually an accurate mathematical statement that one can make. There is a theory that uh, Grothendieck developed uh, in pure mathematics going back to the 80s. He formulated the theory of so-called so -called descent d'enfant or children's drawings. Um, and those are certain diagrams that are bipartite. They are 
They have vertices labeled by black and white, and they're always drawable on, uh, if that's a word, on Riemann surfaces of a fixed genus. And uh, they are connecting a surprisingly large number of disconnected areas of mathematics, including these uh, arcane things like the absolute Galois group and its action on various categories. An example of a children's drawing is, is drawn here. Surprisingly, we found out that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between children's drawings in Grothendieck's sense and the ribbon diagrams that populate precisely the sigma wedge region. I have no idea why that's the case, but I take it as a hint that there is some deep mathematics associated with this sigma wedge. So what do I mean by this? Let me be just quick, give you a formulation of the theorem. Uh, when you appropriately erase from each ribbon diagram the information about sigma plus and sigma minus, then the reduced diagram is in one-to-one -one correspondence precisely with the classification of these uh, children's drawings. That would go roughly as follows. For every connected component here, you are, sorry, for each connected component of the boundary here, you erase sigma plus and glue in a disk and mark the plus disks by black dots mark the white disks, sorry, minus disks by white dots, and the resulting ribbon diagram is Grothendieck's uh, children's drawing, and vice versa. So this is a purely bizarre relation to beautiful parts of mathematics, which I have no idea why they appear in this uh, non-equilibrium context of string worksheets. So by the way, this, this uh, particular example drawn here would correspond to this particular worksheet with just one uh, donut hole torus uh, with two boundaries. Anyway, so now we've uh, come to the summary of the main points of our work so far, at least in the original formalism. I'll come back to the rotated Kellish formalism where there will be a different picture in appearing in a minute. But now we can summarize that instead of expecting a standard partition function to decompose into a sum over topologies labeled by just one integer, the genus of the surface, we now have a triple decomposition. At each order in string perturbation theory, you, ha you have to sum over all possible triple decompositions. You can find the proof of this statement that all possible topologies do appear for each fixed sigma. So you do have to sum over all these possible decompositions whose topology adds up to the topology of the full unrefined sigma. And uh, then you can start speculating. This is how far we can get uh, using the full universal properties of a generic matrix quantum mechanics system, regardless of additional details, or without having some a priori knowledge about the worksheet dynamics. If we had more information about the worksheet dynamics, for example, we can start speculating that uh, 1 over n, of course, plays the role of the string coupling. If we only had the equilibrium analog of this formula, that might make you predict that 1 over n being the string coupling means that in string theory, the string coupling always has to be constant. That, of course, we know in critical string theory is not true. For example, the, example, for example, the case of the linear dilaton, which Eva was mentioning earlier, is a great example where the string coupling depends non-trivially on the location in space-time. So you can start speculating Perhaps in different regions of space-time, there will be different values of the string coupling. One over n that appears here might become g plus and g minus on the forward and backward branches, and perhaps takes a different value g wedge as you control the connection between the two branches of the contour. If that's the case, then this would be an honest triple decomposition into powers of three a priori unrelated couplings. Whether or not this plays out, whether or not there are examples of non-equilibrium string theory with three different values of the couplings in the three different regions of space-time, that remains to be seen, but the possibility topologically is certainly available. There is a topological expansion which would be sensitive precisely to the powers of three different couplings and not just one. So this I would leave as one of the exciting open research problems, whether or not there are realizations of string theory that take advantage of this possibility Perhaps one can actually go back and uh, look at some of the time-dependent backgrounds in string theory that, do, that we do control reasonably well, such as ta tachyon condensation, and see in those examples whether these uh, structures can be matched. Can we find them now retroactively in some of these known examples of critical string theory? 
There's some, there's some, there's some oh, sorry. Sorry, there, there's some um, evidence for what you're saying already, Petter, I would say in the, uh, in those linear Dilton backgrounds, you can oh. incorporate wave packets and use those to assess where the, inter where the interactions are happening. Yeah. Um, and it fits uh, what you would expect from the picture you just summarized Absolutely. You know, very, very beautifully, actually. So you can do some of that. I mean, it's always, yeah, as you yeah. said earlier, it's really not possible to fully say where things are happening in the middle of an S matrix process or this generalization of it, but you can go a pretty far away using- Yeah, uh, I agree with you completely. We've, we've seen some similar hints in, in various uh, corners of critical string theory ourselves. We just haven't published anything on that. So I'm reluctant to say exactly what the picture is, but certainly we see very strong signs that uh, there are cases already in the literature where this uh, is true, that there is a triple decomposition uh, that you can control and maybe then look back at uh, these surfaces and see how this triple decomposition of the perturbation theory actually uh, plays out in those circumstances. So that, that should be exciting for the near future. Uh, one question I was wondering in the triple decomposition of the coupling, is it there is a way, is there a way to do that or is it already doing that where it's compatible with the target space Lorentz symmetry? Or the, or at least some subset of the Lorentz symmetry that is not violated, because for example, in the linear dilaton or the tachyon case, there's like a profile that explicitly like breaks uh, target space Lorentz symmetry, and that. This and is, I'm wondering. This is a beautiful question, but I think I don't have a conclusive answer in the following sense. Imagine the simplest example of a Lorentz invariant situation where you might want to test some of these ideas, and that would be the case of just going to back to equilibrium flat Minkowski space time supersymmetric strings. So it's a stable static internal vacuum, turn off temperature. So conventional kind of uh, plain vanilla uh, vacuum of string theory. And then the expectation is that you should be somehow by following these rules, you should be recovering the proof of unitarity and Katkowski rules in perturbative string theory. And uh, even that has not been somehow completed. The challenges technically seem still overwhelming. So I wouldn't know technically how to actually address this question. And that would be certainly the simplest uh, environment which should be consistent with Lorentz invariance and should be somehow accessible. But uh, if you look at the literature, there is very little known exactly about these perturbative proofs of unitarity in the Lorentz invariant uh, formulation of the theory. So I, I would love to know uh, a better answer, but for now, I think um, more work needs to be done. So a quick tangential comment on a generalization, which you may or may not be interested in. I'll mention it very briefly. You might want to ask what happens if I look at some more complicated contours with three branches or four branches or more branches. Three branches certainly appear in the uh, equilibrium's non-zero temperature contour, which extends along the imaginary axis by some amount proportional to the inverse temperature. Or better yet, if you use the properties of the Green's functions, you can see that actually the contour resides on a compactified time where the complex, the imaginary direction has been compactified with periodicity uh, beta. Uh, this contour similarly gives a decomposition. A typical diagram would now have ingredients instead of fields phi plus and phi or m plus m minus, you also have, and this is by the way, well studied in non equilibrium literature in mesoscopic physics in particular, you have the Matsubara part of the contour, CM. So there is also a field M sub M uh, that uh, gives new propagators and new vertices. So there are now three labels at each vertex, plus, minus, and M. And this is a, an example of a typical ribbon diagram. And uh, to, to spoil the punchline, uh, the decomposition is now on this complicated contour, not into three portions, but into seven portions of the worksheet. It's getting a little more complicated. So there are three different regions. Uh, so first of all, there is a plus region, minus region, and the M region of the worksheet. They are connected along two-dimensional uh, surfaces which can carry arbitrary topologies, but then there are also features of an yet higher order where these two-dimensional surfaces overlap over disks. So it becomes combinatorial more complicated and perhaps less interesting for fundamental physics. Uh, you can always go back and rely on the original schwinger keldysh contour. You don't have to add this Matsubara segment, but if you do add it, there is a sevenfold decomposition of surfaces for whatever it's worth. 
Finally, um, this brings me to the main subject of our last paper so far on this. Uh, so this, this is uh, the point where I switched to the final topic. So the, my, my main results were really here on this transparency. Now we'll revisit those same results in a slightly modified formulation. So this is a, an almost embarrassingly trivial transformation that you can perform on the original fields. Instead of M plus and M minus, people find it very useful to redefine the fields, call their sum M classical and call their difference M quantum. The terminology is somewhat confusing, but it's prevalent in non-equilibrium mesoscopic systems and condensed matter systems, so I'll stick to it. These classical and quantum fields, they're both fluctuating fields that are being integrated over in the path interval. So there's, um, the reason for the terminology is tangential. If you want to know, you can ask me afterwards. And uh, now the question is what happens when we switch to this so-called Kelvish rotated version? First of all, why would you even consider such a simple transformation? There are two reasons. One of them is that in this rotation version, there are now going to be only three independent propagators. The fourth one vanishes identically. The quantum quantum propagator is zero identically. And that's a useful step because in the original formulation, the four different, different propagators between plus and minus vertices, they sum up to this summation rule and therefore make the perturbative expansion into diagrams unnecessarily complicated. This identity holds, but you don't see it in Feynman diagrams until you sum many different diagrams and that's inconvenient. Uh, there should be a better formulation of the theory with fewer necessary propagators, more efficient. And indeed that's the Keldish rotated version. This goes back to Keldish's original uh, paper from 1964 and has been used ever since. There is also a second reason for this importance of this rot Keldish rotated version of the theory, namely in this Simplified propagators, we now, we now have three out of four, which is good, but there's something even more nice that happens. The advanced and retarded propagators that show up, they only carry knowledge about the dynamics, the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, uh, while the classical classical uh, propagator carries only the information about the state that you have chosen as your initial state. So that's a very nice decoupling between dynamics and states. And we want to see what happens with this rotated propagator formalism when we apply the duality to string theory. So now, long story short, we have to redo everything in terms of this rotated set of fields. The propagators will be slightly different. They'll have classical and quantum ends. So let's denote using the notation in the literature, the quantum ends by dotted lines, classical ends by straight lines, and there'll be also vertices Based on this um, redefinition of fields, one can easily see that every vertex has precisely an odd number of quantum ends. That's a new feature compared to the previous uh, diagrammatics. And uh, we find these diagrams a little bit too cumbersome in this uh, standard notation. So we've invented our own notation. Instead of keeping track of these classical and quantum ends, we provide the equivalent information by labeling vertices by signposts. This is like if you walk around the ribbon and you hit a, an intersection, there is a signpost that gives you arrows in the allowed directions that you can travel. And that's the intuitive way we think about these signposts as uh, signposts at uh, intersections of hiking trails or something. And then you can define allowed paths to be those paths that travel along the various ribbon diagrams in directions of the green arrows. And you can use this simple intuition how to build Feynman diagrams to prove very interesting, simple, but powerful statements. For example, if you have an allowed path that's closed, it will make the diagram vanish identically. And you can use this uh, statement to immediately prove that any vacuum diagram in this Kelly's rotated version is zero identically. This is a very powerful and of course, well-known consequence of uh, causality in non-equilibrium Feynman diagrams. But this is a simple way of showing it uh, to be true for the ribbon diagrams. So as a consequence, since all the vacuum diagrams vanish identically, there is no point in evaluating the partition function on the string dual side. You need to study multiple point correlation functions, at least a two point correlation function. Long story short, you can, you can see the details in, 
in our uh, third paper from the uh, sequence mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there is again a very similar decomposition as we saw in the plus minus forward backward formalism. But uh, the decomposition has now two pieces. There is now a natural part of uh, the surface, which we call the classical part of sigma, borrowing the terminology from the fields being labeled classical and quantum, we, we label the regions of the worksheet classical and quantum. This is their combinatorial definition. The nice thing is that the classical part of the surface is made out of only the G advanced and G retarded propagators, and therefore, should only carry the information about the dynamics, but not the state. When everything else, which has to do with the so-called Keldish propagator, the third propagator, which I should have given a, it a proper name here. This one is called the Keldish propagator. That's the only one that becomes non-trivial in non-trivial states. It would vanish if you go back to the stable vacuum. So everybody who belongs to the uh, either the edge that is the Keldish propagator or a plaquette that is adjoint or adjacent to a Keldish propagator. Those are the combinatorial elements that build the so-called quantum part of the surface. So again, we've gone through the combinatorics of proving that both of these parts, the classical part and the quantum part are actually non-trivial topologically. And we reach a similar, but different, qualitatively different prediction about the string perturbation theory in the Keldish rotated formalism. Now the summation is over these double decompositions. You can reorganize usefully this by forgetting all these quantum embellishments. There is no symmetry now between classical and quantum. Those are on two different footings. The classical part is kind of the foundation of the surface. And for a given foundation, you can start embellishing a given classical surface by these quantum embellishments and some resum the perturbation theory as a sum over first the foundations, the classical parts, those will become dominant in the classical limit of the theory, by the way, as we showed in the, one of the last chapters of uh, paper three. Um, and then there'll be quantum corrections that represent, again, another genus expansion on top of the classical genus expansion. So there are two genus expansions here one over the genus of the classical part that will survive in the classical limit of the theory. For example, in the famous Martin Sigia Rose treatment of classical stochastic systems, we took that particular limit and saw how in that particular limit, the classical part has some really nice properties. Plus you can have these quantum embellishments that represent in some sense, the fluctuations, classical and quantum of the non-equilibrium system. So why should these two different descriptions be so dramatically different looking from each other? Uh, after all, when I introduced this Kurdish rotation, it was such an elementary linear transformation of variables. Why shouldn't it be similarly simple as a transformation between two different worksheet pictures? And the answer to that is, there is no really good reason to expect that the worksheet picture between these two different formalisms should be easily related. In order to get from one to the other, you need to resum many, many diagrams in an impractical way. And moreover, if you think of performing some kind of an analog of this sum between the forward and the backward parts of the degrees of freedom now on the string worksheet, you've seen in the sigma plus sigma minus decomposition that the topologies of them are not even uh, isomorphic very often. So there is no identification of them. So you cannot, for example, propose that somehow the sigma classical part is a sum over degrees of freedom living on the plus and minus branch of the worksheet. And similarly for sigma quantum, that doesn't make sense in a theory on the worksheet, which should exhibit some form of diffeomorphism invariance. So there is no reason to expect that the two different decompositions are similar. And indeed, that's what we find, two different types of uh, decompositions of the worksheets. And then the question is, are any of them going to be uh, useful for any particular examples of string theories. So you can speculate again that the string coupling might take different values on the classical and the quantum part of the perturbative expansion, just like we speculated about the same in the triple decomposition case. And I think since I'm basically out of time, even with the, with the uh, extra time that we started over, um, I think I can just show you my conclusions. I think it's an exciting 
uh, opportunity now to see if this axiomatic almost results about the structure of the string correlation theory can be substantiated by examples. And again, we've seen a few hints that some of, some of the relevant examples might already be existent in the, in the literature. The question is whether we can turn this around and turn this into a useful generator for new types of uh, string Warchi descriptions. Is there a new handle on proposing the Warchi dynamics that would have features that are consistent with the universal expansion of these large N theories that we've seen uh, in away from equilibrium. Uh, so of course, there are about three different kinds of uh, examples that you might expect to be relevant. You can look at ADS CFT correspondence. You can look at where, of course, a lot of work has been done, by the way, in space time. This is a completely worksheet perspective that I'm taking. But ADS CFT has indeed been working on Keldy Schwinger type formulations from the effective space time point of view. So there's a lot of work done on that front. You can look at old fashioned matrix models, which would be interesting examples of uh, being able to go to non equilibrium. And to me, the most exciting question is can we just reformulate it conventional critical superstrings from first principles in this expanded formal formalism? So these are all open questions for the future. And uh, I think I'll end my talk here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter, for this wonderful talk. Let's all in mute and give a round of applause. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm amazed to, to point out that we haven't had a single power outage during the talk, at least not, not on my end. So that's already six, very, very successful. Very successful, yeah, that's good. Any questions for uh, Peter? Uh, hi, hi. Uh, sorry, can you remind me again why uh, the, the cutting procedure was not uh, ambiguous for uh, single line diagrams, but was ambiguous for ribbon diagrams? Because for the single line diagrams, the, the, the whole thing there is, is just a graph consisting of lines and vertices. There is no meaningful way of promoting that into, unless the ingredients are ribbons, there is no way of associating a meaningful smooth surface with the ribbon, uh, with the non-ribbon uh, Feynman diagram for, for simple word lines. So that's why you need matrix degrees of freedom to be present in order to give you this unique association with each ribbon diagram you can associate a surface. And then the question naturally, can I extend the cuts across propagators into cuts across um, these plaquettes that are being filled in? So that makes it topologically non-trivial. On the other hand, if you have just word lines of mm -hmm. uh, non-matrix propagators uh, f uh, forming Feynman diagrams, then there is a very clear cutting procedure that just cuts across diagrams in, in a particular way when they're just drawn on a plane and there is no ambiguity in that case. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, if I may follow up a bit, uh, one of the, the reason I was thinking about this is that uh, one of the ways to think about what string theory did for you was that uh, it kind of encodes crossing symmetry, right? Like it, you have these Feynman diagrams in different channels and uh, they all merge into one diagram where it's, uh, these are, the channels are just different, uh, different degeneration limits of this whole sheet. Is there any such sense in which the sigma wedge part of the world sheet is doing the same job? Like we've... That, that's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure if I have any immediate uh, uh, thought on this. Um, certainly the sigma wedge region seems to be quite novel, but I, on the other hand, in order to see its uh, full potential in really giving you the full non-perturbative sorry, the full perturbative uh, hydrogenous expansion, I think you need to go out of equilibrium and you might lose some of the uh, lessons from conventional relativistic equilibrium field theory. There, there's okay. a sense in which uh, the wedge region is at zero temperature in equilibrium, it's supposed to simplify and much of the structure that uh, exists would uh, somehow trivially go away. But again, this is very tentative because there is very little we can say so far about the wedge region. Okay, thank you. But those are all absolutely perfectly valid questions, and I would love to know more detailed answers. It just requires additional non-trivial work to get to those points. So we were at least happy to see 
that some of the universal features are so non-trivial, we wouldn't have expected the wedge region to be topologically so complicated. And that gives us some hint that maybe there is something to look for from first principles on the worksheet, but we don't yet have enough techniques to actually see what exactly goes on. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Can you make a remark on like how are you going to think about the correlators? Here you talk about patching function, but we would like to know the correlators. For example, for CMB, we want to know the in, -in correlators. Right. So for example, for cosmology, the setting would be different. Again, as I said early, early on in the talk, you can play different games uh, with, this, with this formalism. So for example, in cosmology, you might want to declare that the, the T wedge moment, the instant in time where the two branches meet is actually the present. And you can choose to insert all your correlators inside that uh, present moment. And then you just reproduce essentially what, uh, for example, people like Steven Weinberg were proposing as the in informalism for cosmology, which has attracted a lot of attention. And uh, so you can rewrite everything in that slightly modified um, context. And but but the correlators are not unsure, right? So they won't satisfy the, like, uh, the unsure condition for the vertex operator. So how are you going to do that? It has to be studied on a case by case basis. I don't think we can provide any universal one swoop prescription for how to find the matching. Certainly I would expect the string theory to have some particular set of consistent vertex operators and perhaps be in the same sense on shell as we know a perturbative strings to be. And then you can try to match onto perhaps some gauge invariant quantities on, on the low side if there is a gauge symmetry in the matrix uh, system. But again, the details will be important and uh, it might make more sense to focus on a case by case study and study individual examples uh, fully before making some generalizing conclusions about what's possible or what's not possible. I'm not sure I know how to apply this at the present moment to cosmology. So I wouldn't be able to provide a calculation of cosmological correlators for CMB and isotropies using this formalism, but certainly that's one of the motivations for developing this carefully from the theoretical perspective from first principles before we can see whether this can be useful at some later stage. The hope is certainly, mm -hmm. otherwise I wouldn't be working on this. Uh, my hope is that this <laughs> will be one of the areas where we can be useful, but maybe it's not gonna happen next month. Maybe it takes a few years before one can develop the formalism properly. Okay, thank you. Sure. I mean, you wouldn't disagree with reducing the system to the effective field theory level when appropriate, which is the case for CMB. Oh yeah, would, absolutely. Would you, I mean, you know. Yeah, so, so there could be two different questions. One can be asking, can I actually use uh, some form of string dualities to um, provide new techniques for calculating the appropriate correlators in cosmology? And the, cert the answer certainly there is yes. If, if you use uh, the space-time picture, it's uh, probably much more immediate. But my interest specifically is to say, can we also start bringing up the worksheet techniques uh, more systematically to see what is it that we are still missing? Maybe there are some big corners of string theory which we haven't accessed yet. And perhaps those could be accessed by taking this non-equilibrium first principles uh, perspective more seriously and later on seeing whether that can influence how we think about applying string theory to cosmology. So my, my interest here is not to necessarily extract the, the fastest possible string theory application to cosmology, but to see if we can develop kind of a second wave uh, using worksheet techniques. Sure, yeah, can I, can I ask a different question? Um, Sure. Um, so I, I appreciate what you're saying about a certain possible uni universality about the matrix structure, but it, it seems that there are sometimes at least, you know, Not other, other ingredients that are involved. I, I lost your audio for a while. Oh, sorry. Um, I have my teaching podcaster thing. So <laughs> does it, if it's not working, I can just stop. Oh. Um, are, are you not, it's still not working? No, no, it's fine. I can hear oh, it you. Is, it yeah, is we working. can hear you. Now I have okay. my own technical difficulties here. But it, okay, can... sorry. Just, it's a very quick point, but um, it's, I think that, you know, there's, 
another way which is in the same spirit you're 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 proposing to assess you know what kind of structures are there would be to so in you know the the matrix structure sort of has to do with fluxes or d brains um, microscopically and in any solution in the landscape say you can trade the fluxes that exist for brains and see what it is that lives on those and you know there's inevitably some matrix sector but right. there's but there can be other sectors for example situations where there are both ns and d brains and hence um, multi-fundamental matter for okay. example mm -hmm. um and so um, I've always thought it's intriguing that, that that is intriguing. There's some numerology that relates that to other counts of vacua and such things. Mm -hmm. um, and this would just, I think, be you know an add-on to what you're doing. It would right. it would introduce new structures into the diagrammatics. It one would have to ask whether there's really a perturbative description that's useful. But there is a weak string coupling and weak curvatures in these solutions that I have in mind. Right. So there's definitely hope for that. Um, yeah. I just wanted to mention that very briefly because I agree that a matrix structure is part of it, but it's not clear to me that it's universally the whole no, uh, no. structure of even the diagrammatics that would be needed. Here, what I mean by universality was we are fishing precisely for all those features that are universal for all systems which are described by matrix degrees of freedom. So leaving out all other possible systems, that of course doesn't make it completely universal across all possible systems that one might be interested in. But the deeper end situation that you, you, you brought in, I think it will be extremely interesting to take that other perspective as well, that you can just study really the brain constructions and see how deep brains in particular fit into the scheme, because it should be not impossible to put uh, brains on schwinger keldish contours and see how they respond. And that might be one extra leg of the perspective that you can take, that there is, there is some additional information you can extract from kind of knowing how a bunch of uh, deep brains in space-time might respond to the existence of the schwinger keldish doubling. So there are some speculations on that front, but again, we, we stayed away from adding too many moving parts because the story was already sufficiently intriguing and complicated the way it is without uh, looking at specific, for example, brain uh, examples, how, how this would work for some particular uh, system of D-brains. Thanks, and thanks very much for the very interesting talk. Thank you, thanks for listening. Thanks for the questions. Are there more questions for Peter? Otherwise, let's uh, thank Peter again. Thank you. Good seeing everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. That was a great talk. Right. Stop the recording. Thanks, guys. And